Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Today, we'll be talking about LARC, Long-Acting Reversible Contraception with Dr. Caroline Friedman. Caroline, welcome to Healthful Woman. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Tell our listeners, what is long-acting reversible contraception? So long-acting reversible contraception refers to primarily two different types of birth control that are considered long-acting, meaning you, you start it, you put it in once, you don't have to worry about it again for at least a few years. And reversible, meaning that you can take it out and get pregnant again. And the two that we generally refer to are things called intrauterine devices, of which there are a few, and the subdermal implant or a small implant that goes in your arm underneath the skin. Right. And so the term reversible really is differentiating these forms from something like getting your your tubes tied, for example. Correct. Right. Right. Because that's irreversible. Right. Or a vasectomy, irreversible, right. or mostly irreversible. Right. Okay. So these are things women can have. They work for a very long time. But if they want them removed or want to get pregnant again, easily done, reversible, and they can go back to being fertile again, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And so in general, just we're going to focus on long-acting reversible contraception, but just as a little bit of background, when we're talking to women about contraception or birth control, what are generally the options you go through with them? before discussing or in addition to discussing the long acting ones? Sure. So I generally like to mention all of the available options. And in my counseling, I'll usually start by discussing the least effective ones and moving on to the more effective ones. And so in the less effective categories, we think about things like timed intercourse or natural family planning methods where you pay attention to when you think you're ovulating and try to avoid having unprotected sex during that time period. We also think about things called withdrawal and even use of condoms, generally speaking, are not as effective as some other options. The nice thing about condoms are that they are the only form of birth control that actually prevents sexually transmitted infections. So I will often advise patients to use those in addition to other methods for preventing um, infections as well as preventing pregnancy. But if you're just talking from a pregnancy prevention standpoint, not as effective as some of the other options. Right. Condoms are, are pretty effective. I mean, but they're not, people quote like 97% or something like that because a condom could break or whatever. Uh, but as you said, condoms are really the only way to prevent sexually transmitted infections. So they're more commonly used for people who are, let's say, not in a monogamous relationship and they're worried about potentially, you know, getting an infection or spreading an infection, or they are in, in a relationship uh, with one person, but it's known that one of them has an infection, the other one doesn't want to get it, condoms would be the most effective. But in terms of contraception, so you go through those, and then what would be the next option that you'd go over with them? So then we move on to discussion of um, like birth control pills, and there are um, various types of pills, but both forms have hormones in them. One has hormones that include estrogen and progesterone, and then another form is progesterone only. Pills, if they are used every day on time like they're supposed to, are also pretty good, about 92 to 95% effective. The downside is you have to remember to take them every single day. And they're a hormone that you're taking that's getting absorbed into your system that some patients can't take or don't want to take due to side effects or due to other reasons. Right. And so for the hormonal ones, like birth control pills, they're going to prevent women from ovulating, meaning in most of the pill formulations, women will get their period every month or every three months based on exactly what type they take. Right but they won't be releasing an egg every month. So they won't have the ability to get pregnant. Again, the downside, of course, is that they have to take a pill, which logistically for some people is difficult. For some people, it's very easy. For some people, it's very difficult and everything in between. Right. And there are side effects. The nice thing about oral contraceptive pills is there's so many formulations based on exactly which type of progesterone they use and what are the doses of the estrogen and progesterone. And there's so many options for women that all work. It's just a matter of which has the best side effect profile. Correct. And so there's a little bit of trial and error in there when you start. Yeah. And that's very important for women to know that starting on a pill does not mean this is one you have to take for the rest of your life. It's just the first one we try. And there isn't a ton of science for which one is picked first. You try to pick something that's kind of middle of the road and then move in one direction based on some side effects or another direction based on the others. Exactly. And these are all shorter acting 
because if you stop taking the pill, you can get pregnant pretty much. And then there's other ways to deliver the hormones for short acting besides pill. There's an option for a ring that goes in the vagina, correct? Correct. And that basically just releases the same hormones, but instead of swallowing a pill every month, it's just a ring you place once a month. Right. So you put the ring in and you um, leave it there for three weeks and then take it out for a week in which you would get your period and then place a new one. can also take it out during intercourse and things like that, but you've got to put it, you have to remember to put it back in pretty quickly. Otherwise the hormone levels drop and again, you can get pregnant. Right. And so these are all of the shorter acting forms of hormonal contraception. There is an injection that you could take as well. It's, it's every three months. That's the that's the Depo-Provera, which is a progesterone injection every three months, which is, I guess, medium acting, I suppose, three months. And then what are the reasons that someone might be interested in long acting contraception? So, you know, the reasons are plentiful, but really speaking, if you, if a woman is not wanting to get pregnant for at least a few years, that's one reason to get something long acting. If someone is traveling a lot or really busy for work and doesn't necessarily have time to, to get prescriptions refilled or to come to their doctor every three months to get the shot or things like that could be a reason as well. And if someone's done having children altogether and, you know, at the age of, let's say 40, and they're just trying to not get pregnant again until they reach the age of menopause, which is about 51 on average in the United States, then getting a 10-year copper IUD will get them pretty much all the way there, which is really nice. Right. So 10 years, as as far as we know, that's the, of all the options available, that is the longest option right. and for reversible. Exactly. And it's actually getting pushed up to about 12 years now. Right. It probably works for longer, but it's hard to study that because you have to follow people out for a very, very long time. Right. And so when our listeners are thinking of long acting, what would you say the range would be like from two years to 10 years in that sort of range? I mean, even shorter. Some some patients come and say, I don't, I don't want to think about anything for six months to a year. I will still offer them these options because even if it's approved for five or 10 years, but you just know that you're not going to remember to take a pill for six months, but you absolutely don't want to get pregnant for six months, we can place an IUD and take it out six months later. It's not a big deal. Right. The only downside is it's a quote unquote a procedure to have it put in and taken out. Obviously, it's not a, a major procedure. It's not an operation or anything like that, but it does require something to have it put in and taken out. So right. that's a potential downside, right. uh, I suppose, for having that. And then the difference between, you mentioned the intrauterine device, which most people know as the IUD. That's what it stands for, intrauterine device. And then you mentioned an implant as well. So let's start with the implant. Okay. So what exactly is that? Right now, there's only one brand implant out there. It's called the Nexplanon. It is about the size of a matchstick, so about four centimeters in length and very, very skinny. And it delivers progesterone, similar to a Depo-Provera shot or a progesterone-only pill. It does get absorbed into your bloodstream, but again, only progesterone, no estrogen. It gets inserted very easily with a special device just underneath the skin of your arm, kind of under like where your biceps is. And it's invisible. You can't, you shouldn't have any side effects from like the actual device being there. You can feel it if you're touching your arm, but that's actually a good thing because then we know it's there and in the right spot. And so that's placed in an office setting? Exactly. We just use a little numbing, numbing medicine to take away the pain of placing it, make a small, tiny incision, and then use the inserter device to place it. The whole thing takes five to 10 minutes. So it's probably the equivalent in terms of pain or procedures, getting a mole removed by a dermatologist. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's a little tiny incision. This implant gets placed just under the skin. The incision, does it have to get sewn closed or just heals on its own? No, it heals on its own. We'll put a little steri strip over it just for a day or two heals on its own, and it's effective immediately. And how long does that last for? Three years at this point. For three years. And so after three years, it would have to be removed or does it stay in forever? If you don't care about whether or not it's being effective anymore, I guess theoretically you could leave it in, but we usually remove it. And then many people say like it and want another one, you can remove it and have a new one replaced in the same incision on the same day. And is it something that gives people side effects, uh, aside from just the the soreness of the arm, the date went in, but for the long term, do people tend to have side effects from that type of contraception? Most women do really well on it. The um, most common side effect about 15% of the time is the complaint of irregular bleeding. So either just unpredictable length between periods, or maybe you skip a period a month here or there, some spotting in between, but that usually improves after the first few months of use. So we try to encourage women to ride it out 
for that long and see what goes on after. Right. The types of contraception that'll give women regular periods are ones that have estrogen and progesterone because that mimics what happens over the course of a month typically. And so those will give women regular periods. They could be designed to do it every two months or every three months, but basically they'll be predictable and regular for most women. When there's progesterone and no estrogen, the downside is that women could have irregular periods for some time, right. uh, but sometimes the periods actually get lighter and go away. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right. So if you take an estrogen and progesterone pill and then you have placebos or you stop, you'll get a period. If you do the progesterone only and continue it, a lot of women will stop getting their periods. And one of the other advantages to it is many of the times estrogen is something women can't take for several reasons, for health reasons, correct? Correct. What might be those reasons? Like what type of woman would say, I want contraception and I prefer something hormonal, but I, I can't have estrogen. Yeah. So anybody who has had a history of a blood clot in their legs or in their lungs, we do not want to give estrogen to because that increases the risk of that happening again. Anybody who's had any like estrogen sensitive cancer, like a breast cancer or endometrial cancer, we wouldn't want to give that to. Anybody who's had liver disease, high blood pressure, there's some controversy if you're smoking, it's especially over the age of 35, estrogen can increase your risk of stroke. So we generally try to stay away from that as well. Right. So there's a fair number of women who really are advised not to take estrogen, but on the flip side, getting pregnant could also be dangerous. So it's it's kind of a balance of figuring out you want to give them contraception because either they don't want to get pregnant or it's not safe for them to get pregnant or a combination of, of the two. But the contraception might have estrogen as well. And so sometimes you're trying to balance which is more dangerous, but if there's an option that just has progesterone, that's a really good option for these women. Right. That is the implant right. form of long acting. So again, that's three years, it's placed under the skin, it's progesterone only, and it's, it's all of the, well, there's only one implant on the market, but the implants are designed to release hormone. Right. And that's different from the IUD in several ways, obviously. The first is where the device is inserted, and IUD is obviously in the uterus. How is that? done logistically. Right. So the IUD we place also in the office for patients that will start off feeling just like a regular pelvic exam that we do, let's say for a pap smear, or if you're having other complaints and we're doing an evaluation or any tests, place a speculum, we look at the cervix. And then essentially we just place the IUD through the cervical opening into the uterus using an insertion device. The whole thing also takes about 10 minutes. Most women feel a little bit crampy during and immediately following, although it really varies from person to person. I find some women feel no pain and some women feel a little bit more pain. And so they don't need anesthesia. They're not put to sleep. It's not done in an operating room. This is an office procedure. Exactly. And is there anything that women can do maybe uh, to alleviate that pain, either in advance of having the IUD or right afterwards? What do you recommend? To yeah, women. usually I recommend that they take some ibuprofen either right before or right after. We can give it to them in the office. Sometimes it seems to help. Again, sometimes not so much, but we don't think it really hurts. Right. And so the IUD goes in and then once it's in place, what types of IUDs are there in terms of when you said with the implant under the skin, there's really only one type, but for IUDs, there are several on the market. Right. So what are the differences between them other than maybe just different companies? So the two big differences are whether they have hormone in them at all, in which case all the hormonal IUDs are progesterone only as well, or if there's no hormone and of that, there's only one kind and that's the copper IUD or the brand name Paragard. Right. And the copper one, so has no hormones at all. So there wouldn't be any side effects from the hormone per se, and it should not really affect the period other than maybe it's a little bit heavier at the beginning because there's an IUD in there. And then that is the one that lasts for how long? That one lasts for about 10 years. The one downside of the copper IUD is if a woman is prone to having heavier painful periods already, sometimes the copper IUD for whatever reason tends to exacerbate those types of periods. Right. And so if there's no hormones there, the the way that the IUD would work in preventing pregnancy is it basically doesn't allow the sperm to live past the uterus, right? Right. It makes it changes the cervical mucus, it changes the lining of the uterus, and it prevents fertilization between the sperm and the egg. Right. One of the misconceptions out there is people used to think, or some still do think, that an IUD, the way it prevents pregnancy is by causing a miscarriage. And that's actually not true. The women right. don't become pregnant with the IUD. It prevents pregnancy. I mean, it could cause a miscarriage, but that's not how it functions as a contraceptive, as birth control. Right. And so the copper is the one with no hormones. And so the only real side effect other than the 
maybe cramping on the day of could be heavier periods with the regular periods, uh, but that tends to go away after a certain amount of time. Yes. Usually there are, there really are a small handful of people that the copper ID just doesn't work for them. And then we switch to something different. Right. And what is it when you say a switch? Is that, a, is that a big deal to switch IUDs? Um, taking out an IUD is generally very, very simple. Again, you come to the office, we do the same type of exam and all IUDs have small strings that come out of the cervix into the top of the vagina. And so we generally see those, grab them with a little clasp and pull the IUD out. No problem. Right. And the IUD is also very small. It's, it's, smaller than two matchsticks shaped as a T. Right. It's it's pretty small. And people see it, they're surprised by how small it is actually and that it works. The kinds of IUDs that have hormones, you said they secrete progesterone. Right. And for them, so it is an IUD, but it's also hormones. The hormones there is a much lower amount though than what would be in the implant in the arm, correct? So in terms of what your body is absorbing into the bloodstream, it is a much lower amount. Some people absorb almost none. Some people absorb a little bit. And so usually I'll tell women that they are not likely to have as many hormonal side effects that one might think of with a pill or the shot or even the implant, although some women do. But because generally speaking, you're absorbing a lot less of that progesterone, it's not causing those systemic effects. The progesterone really acts locally inside the uterus to prevent pregnancy. And it does that by changing mostly the thickness of the cervical mucus and also the lining of the uterus. Right. And one of the nice side effects of the IUDs with hormones is it almost always makes periods lighter, less frequent, and at a certain percentage of women, they go away entirely. Exactly. Right. But it's not done in the same mechanism as if the implant in the arm, because there the progesterone has to get absorbed into the bloodstream and affect the entire body and whether you ovulate and all those, whereas here it's really just acting locally on the lining of the uterus. So it's a much lower amount of hormone. And how long do those last for? Depends on which one you get, but anywhere from three to six years. You have the benefit of the hormone, if it is a benefit for women, but a little bit of a trade-off because it's it's not quite as long as the copper IUD. Right. And Let's say someone has an IUD placed and they decide, you know, they were thinking they didn't want to get pregnant again, but then two years later they decide, hey, you know, I changed my mind. I want to get pregnant. So you mentioned that it's not technically difficult to remove the IUD, but when it's removed, what about their fertility? Yeah. So in theory, they should be fertile right away because it's not suppressing ovulation. Your body should be ovulating throughout the time that you have the IUD in place. And if we remove it, it should continue to do so and you should be able to get pregnant as soon as you would had you not had the IUD in place. Right. And there's no real recommendation that you have to wait after getting an IUD removed a certain amount of cycles before safe, like getting pregnancy can happen uh, right away, which is, which is great. What are, what are some of the possible risks of placing an IUD? Obviously, it's a very safe procedure and it, the, the chance of a complication is very, very low. But what are the things that could potentially happen that you talk to women about or things that you look for? Anytime we do any kind of procedure, the biggest or most like, likely risk would be bleeding or infection. But in that case, it's extremely rare. And we don't even necessarily like test for infection or anything like that prior to placing it. If you do have an active infection, we generally wait until that's cleared up before placing it. Some of the more serious, but also much less common risks would be that the IUD falls out after we place it, and therefore it's not doing anything useful if it's not inside, or that it partially embeds itself a little bit into the wall of the uterus or misplaces itself inside the cavity of the uterus and needs to be taken out and replaced, or that the IUD actually goes through the other side of the uterus into the abdominal cavity. That's called a perforation, but that's exceedingly, exceedingly rare. And so we try not to let that deter people from getting it since it's so rare and such a great form of birth control. Right. In terms of the IUD uh, being placed, what we call sort of misplaced, the interesting thing is that the IUD number one sits inside the cavity of the uterus. It, it's not meant to like embed itself into the wall of the right. uterus. But sometimes we see that happen. Most people don't even know that it happens, but sometimes people will get heavier periods that they're more pain with it. And when we look on ultrasound afterwards, and we started doing this routinely on all women who have IUDs placed in our practice or referred to us about two weeks later, we'll look. And it's sometimes it's, it's the most fascinating thing because they have an ultrasound right after it's done and it confirms it's in the right place. And then sometimes two weeks later, it's upside down or it's halfway out, or it's sideways, or one of the arms is like right into the middle of the uterus. And they can, what's called migrate or move a little bit. And that's why we recommend checking in two weeks to see where it is. Now, 
whether it matters if it's misplaced or not is also an area of controversy. People don't know for sure. Uh, presumably the ones that secrete hormones, it wouldn't matter as much because they're still, as long as they're still inside, they're still inside. But the ones that like the copper IUD, it's not clear. It's possible that if it's too low down in the uterus or if it's upside down, maybe it wouldn't work. So those are the ones we typically recommend pulling it out and doing it again. And usually if we've placed an IUD, we don't really want to take risks and say, well, it moved around, let's see what happens. And so just to be safe, we'll often take it out and replace it. Right. And in terms of perforation, that can happen with pretty much all gynecologic procedures. Anytime we put an instrument inside the uterus through the cervix, there's a, I mean, we obviously do a lot of things to prevent this from happening, but there's always a chance that the instrument goes farther than we expected and actually pokes through the back of the uterus. It tends not to be terribly dangerous when that happens. Uh, clearly, if the IUDs in the abdomen, it's not going to be working in terms of birth control. So that's one reason that it have to be addressed. And the thought is that probably it's best to remove it. Uh, but the downside is that would require a, a laparoscopic operation to remove it, which happens, as you said, quite rarely yeah. uh, in terms of the number of IUDs placed. And the amazing thing that I've learned about IUDs is the likelihood that someone will get pregnant while having an ID is so low. It's basically the same as if your tubes were tied. Just about. Which is remarkable. People don't necessarily recognize how effective this is as a birth control method, as a contraceptive. It is, it's really, it's literally almost the same thing as getting your tubes tied, but it's reversible. Right. And even the implant we think is exactly as effective as getting your tubes tied. Yeah. And the tubes tied obviously does need an operation for sure. And it's irreversible. And we've seen in our practice, the number of women asking for these has steadily gone up over the years. Why do you think that is? I think that, you know, the recent literature that's come out has just recognized that it's so safe and so, for lack of a better term, easy to get that women have just over time decided to try it and then word of mouth and friends get it and siblings get it. And for whatever reason, it's just really taken off in the last few years. I think women are busy, women are working, women are are more interested in having good control over their reproductive plans. And so they really are interested in being able to do this. Yeah, I think that IUDs got a got a bad name from many years ago when there there were different kinds and there were a lot of different IUDs IUDs have been tried over the years and some of them were had more complications and also they were possibly being placed in women with active infections and people thought that they gave you an increased risk of infection and you know if you are one of the few people who gets pregnant with an IUD it's a higher risk pregnancy but clearly the risk of getting pregnant overall is so low that your risk is lower. But I think that number one, some of it's marketing that more people have them. So more people talk about them. So more people know about them. So people tell their friends or doctors have it. And I think some of it is also the the introduction of the ones with hormones, because not only do women have the opportunity to have you know long acting reversible contraception, but for many women having a decrease in the frequency or the amount of their periods was so beneficial to them, either just logistically or some women who suffered from very heavy periods and now they don't. And that's a, uh, has been a real, I think, boon to the market, so to speak, of getting IUDs. In the medical community, when, you know, when OBs and GYNs talk about this, the doctors think the IUDs are great. Now, this isn't something that's like, you know, patients are pushing people to do. We begrudgingly do them. The doctors think it's fantastic because there's less failure rates and less complications than with pills, which you know are, are also fantastic, but they have their own difficulties, especially they have to be taken every day. Right. And so in your practice, uh, in terms of this, are you seeing a lot of women choose the implants or are they mostly choosing IUDs or, and has that changed over time? I think in our current practice, because we have so many obstetric patients, I think a lot of them are choosing IUD over implants because they're less worried about the placement, the procedure having to be done as a pelvic placement. In my experience, I find that younger women, adolescents, women more in their twenties, things like that, are more likely to choose the implant, but it's really a mixture of both and it's really a personal preference. Yeah, that is interesting. It used to be, you know, when I was training, one of the things was women who didn't have children would rarely get an IUD. That's not the case anymore at all. It didn't really make any sense. There wasn't any great logic to it other than it's maybe slightly easier to place if someone's, you know, had a vaginal delivery right. before the cervix is a, you know, a little more open, but there wasn't any medical reason why it made a difference at all. No. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's fantastic. 
Excellent. So LARC, L-A-R-C, Long Acting Reversible Contraception. If you have any questions about this, you can email us. Dr. Friedman, Caroline, thank you so much for coming and discussing this uh, with our listeners. We look forward to having you back on future podcasts on Healthful Woman. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.